God, it's your grace that brings us back to your fold. And we thank you so much for that grace. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this awesome time of worship. We pray for this speaker. We pray for this weekend. Um, and that we finish strong, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name. Can you hear me? Good morning, Grace family. Anybody love Jesus? All right. I'm so grateful to greet you in the name that is above every name today. This is a special chapel. All chapels are special because we kiss the king in worship. Amen. But today is extra special for me because my dad is the speaker. How do you introduce your dad? Only one picture can do that adequately. And I'll try to introduce him quickly because I could introduce him for the next two hours. But I did pray and ask God to reveal to me how to introduce you to him. Reverend Dr. Robert Smith, Jr. Don't be confused by the fact that his last name is Smith and mine is Robinson. You see, it was 20 years ago when my biological father, Pastor E.K. Bailey, was being called home to glory. And as he was dead bolting the evening of his life, he made preparations for our church by making sure that they voted on another pastor because he said churches shouldn't die with pastors. He met with my family and said, take care of each other. Be faithful to the Lord. And then he called Dr. Robert Smith Jr. and said, I believe my work here is done, but I want to know, will you be Kokesha's daddy? She's going into ministry. She's going to seminary. You're the greatest teacher at her seminary. Be her father. And then he looked at me and said, Kokesha, if you ever marry a preacher, please don't marry somebody that can't preach. <laughs> I love the fact that Dr. Smith took on that challenge, and he did that by finding me when I was thinking about dropping out of seminary because I thought I was too grief-stricken. I also thought that I didn't have what it took to be a woman in leadership. You're meeting me at 50. You should have known me 30 years ago when I was insecure and shy and didn't think that God could use me. And I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit has reminded me, like I remind you, that I'm enough through Christ. Dr. Smith did that too. He didn't know that I went upstairs to withdraw because I thought I'm over Greek and Hebrew. I don't think I have time for this. I was grief stricken, I was depressed. Maybe you are here today and you are smiling but depressed, that was me. And I remember Dr. Smith said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. And he said, why are you standing in this office? And I said, because I'm gonna withdraw from seminary because I can't take it anymore. And he said, oh no, you're not. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm gonna change programs because I don't think I could do Hebrew and Greek. And some of my friends are getting masters and they don't even need Hebrew and Greek. And he said, but Kokesha, for what you've been called to do, you got to have Hebrew and Greek. So get yourself out of this line and over to this line. And then go make an appointment to get some tutoring. And how was he to know that my tutor would become my husband? Thank God for tutoring and Dr. Smith. Oh, bless the Lord. He also said, make friends with the janitor of this seminary because he doesn't need to be afraid when he sees you studying at night. And from this day on, I want you to come to this basement and I want you to study Hebrew and Greek all night long. And I want the janitor to know that you're gonna be in this room every night until graduation. I stand before you today by the amazing grace of God with a Master of Divinity working on a Doctorate of Theology because of God's grace and the push of Reverend Dr. Robert Smith Jr. Not only did he push me as a professor and to be a better minister, and he did that to all preachers as he would hear people preach and say, you had 19 and a half minutes and you exhorted for 18 and a half minutes. Do not treat texts like a hotel. You don't visit texts of the Bible, you live there. This is the kind of man that you'll hear from today. But this picture represents what he did to ultimately show that I'm your dad. He invited Timothy to take me out on a date the rest is history. And then he walked me down the aisle and then turned around and married us. 
He is a messenger. He is a man of his word. He is a good friend to his friends, even when they are promoted to glory. And he's been my dad. After chapel, I said after chapel, Google him because he's a big deal. And you'll read the commentaries that he's contributed to. You'll read where he has been honored by Preaching Magazine. You'll hear how he has been honored by Christianity Today. You'll hear about the books that he has written. But I want you to know he is the proud husband of Dr. Wanda Smith. He has four children, two are in heaven. He has grandchildren, and he is so excited about being the spiritual father to many. He's a friend and mentor to Tiberius, to Kokesha, to Kokesha's husband. And next week at Beeson Divinity School, a conference will be named in his honor so that the world will know he's retiring next week, but retiring is not his end. In his words, he's only being repurposed. I present to you one of the greatest preachers in American history. I thank the Lord for the fire that burns and Reverend Dr. Robert Smith, Jr. Will you say with me, welcome to Grace, Dr. Smith. Welcome to Grace, Dr. Smith. And will you say, we love you, Daddy Doc. Love you, Daddy Doc. Now turn with me in your Bibles to First Kings. We love you. Thank you. We're proud of you. 1 Kings chapter 19, do you have it? Say amen. amen. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Verse three, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Verse 4, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and of a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, and there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10, he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Verse 11, the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper when Elijah heard it. He pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets in death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came into the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. The word of the Lord is blessed. Thanks be to God. Even now, Lord Jesus, even now, 
even now. For I ask this in your name. Amen. God be praised. All that she has said, none of it will pass out of time into eternity. The only thing that matters is I'm your brother and that we are the children of God and therefore your brother has come back home to just be with you. That has eternal implications. Have you been to, in, to Horeb? Have you been to Horeb? The God who manifests himself by his mighty acts is fully revealed in Jesus Christ, his incarnate son, accomplishes his purpose through the spirit of his word. If that sounds theologically and biblically responsible and accurate, repeat it after me. The God. The God. The God. The God, the God. Who manifests himself manifests. through his mighty works is fully revealed in Jesus Christ, his incarnate son. Enables us to accomplish his purposes through the spirit of his word. James A. Sanders has written that biblical characters do not primarily serve us as models for morality, but rather as mirrors for identity. Not models for morality, but mirrors for identity. They help us to see who we are in the scriptural scrapbook. And so this morning, as we look at this pericope, this teaching paragraph in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 18, I desire that we would see ourselves, see our portrait, see our picture in the scriptural scrapbook, a mirror for identity. For we have the uh, proclivity and the propensity and the tendency to make biblical characters unreal and to rid them of their flesh and blood so that they don't feel what we feel and they don't experience what we experience. But not so with Elijah. I know that he went to heaven without dying. But according to James 5.17, Elijah was a man of like passions, just like we are. And here is Elijah in the 17th chapter of this great book of 1 Kings helping us to see that we are just like he is. Elijah steps on the scene. It reminds me of what Jim McKay would say as he would give the opening introduction to the wide world of sports programs. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports and what lays ahead from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. This is ABC's wide world of sports. From the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. In the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, he walks around with the key to the water department on his belt and gives a three and a half year meteorological report. For three and a half years, there will be no rain, nor will there be any dew. And the vegetation dies. Cattle will die. Death is all around. Thrill of victory. His prediction, his pronostication takes place. But in this moment of death, God keeps a brook babbling and bubbling for him to drink from and sends a blackbird catering service to feed him. Meals on wings, ravens, unclean birds who bring clean food once in the morning and once in the evening. Thrill of victory. But then the brook dries up and God sends Elijah to northwest Palestine where there is a 
widow from Zarephath who was along with her son gathering sticks to make a fire to make a whole cake. That's a gigantic biscuit. She's going to eat along with him and they're going to die because there will be no longer any meal or any oil. But Elijah makes this audacious request. Make me a little cake first. And as if she has anticipated what Jesus will say in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And she fixes him a little cake first with nothing left. And God puts a cornfield in her barrel and an oil well in her cruise so that every time she dips out some meal and some oil, God puts oil and meal back in. And it lasts her for three and a half years. Thrill of victory. Her son dies. She sends for him. And God uses him to resuscitate the boy. Thrill of victory. There's a showdown at sundown on Mount Carmel. And Elijah gives the prophets of Baal time to pray to their God to bring down fire. And when that God does not do it, God speaks to Elijah and Elijah prays and God answers and sends down fire to burn up wet wood, to burn up dust, to bring burn up rocks, thrill of victory. But then when Queen Jezebel gets word of it, she's the queen of the northern kingdom. She's really the king, but uh, we'll call her queen. And as a result of that, she says to Elijah, I'm putting an APB out on you 24 hours. In 24 hours, you'll be like one of the dead prophets that you just killed on Mount Carmel. And Elijah, the Bible says, is afraid. He runs. He leaves his servant at Beersheba. He goes a day's journey. He prays. He says to God, take my life. I've had enough. I no longer want to live. I'm no better than my ancestors. Agony of defeats from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. And that's where we are. He's afraid. Do prophets fear? Do professors and presidents fear? Do students fear who are Christians? Yes! Oh, I know. We want to be Christians who are super Christians. God never called us to be super Christians. He called us to be Christians. No need to feign, pretend anything. It's all right to say to him what the Father said to Jesus when the other disciples could not raise this boy from this demonic state. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, I'm afraid. Lord, I'm frustrated. Lord, I'm angry. Lord, I feel like giving up. It's all right. He already knows it, whether you say it or not. According to Psalm 139, verse 2, he knows my thoughts are far off. And before I get the thought, he's already abducted the thought, caught the thoughts, and interpreted the thought. So tell him what's on your heart. As we would say in the African-American church, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry. He'll answer by and by. Feel a little prayer wheel turning. Know a little fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus will make things all right. He's afraid. He runs. And at Beersheba, he leaves his servant so that he is now alone after going one day's journey in the desert. And now God has him exactly where God wants him to be, alone. For our most important experiences will not come when we're in the context of friends, but when we are alone. Jacob's highest spiritual experience came when he was alone. The ladder with angels ascending and descending and God speaking from the ladder saying, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, but he never said I'm the God of Jacob because Jacob and God had never had an intersecting encounter hmm. until later on at the Jabbok River. And there God, 
whether it is through a Christophany, that is Christ before Bethlehem, or Theophany, that is God who takes on flesh some kind of appearance and encounters him at the Jabbok River, and Jacob finally has to say to God, through the angel that he is wrestling with, I will not let you go until you bless me. He gets transformation. A name that's changed from Jacob, meaning deceiver, meaning fix one who is wrestling and deceiving, to Israel, meaning God fights. He gets transformation, but at the cost of dislocation. His hip is out of joint. And we want transformation, but we don't want dislocation. But when you have transformation and there's an encounter with God, he dislocates some things in your life. He dislocates your thinking. He dislocates your way of living. Your highest moments will come when you're alone. And some of us are afraid to be alone. How long has it been since you've talked to the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secret? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since your mind has been at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? Jacob is alone, all by himself. And he comes to the bottom and he says, Lord, take my life. I don't want to live any longer. I'm no better than my ancestors. From a man who went from the thrill of victory on Mount Carmel to the agony of defeat now in the wilderness. Take my life. That's exactly what God wanted to do. Was to take his life, not extension, no. But God wanted to totally possess his life. As Alexander White, the 19th century Scottish preacher said, Lord, I give myself to thee, and whatever I cannot give, I invite you to take, take. So give as much as you know of yourself to as much as you know of God. Let him take your life so that you not only associate with God, but God is your owner. You not only have God as your landlord, you have God who owns the actual complex of your life. Take my life. I no longer want to live. He says, I've had enough. Do you know that language? I've had enough. He's at the bottom. I know what it's like to be at the bottom. I know what it's like to hear the word cancer three times. I know what it's like. In fact, I had to cancel coming here a couple of years ago because of a stroke twice. I know what it's like to lose a son working at a store doing his job and to have a robber break in and take his life and not get a dime. And to lose my dear, dear son at 52 last year. I know what it's like to be a widower. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be at the bottom. I've been to the bottom. But I want you to know that the bottom is solid. Because Christ is there. And if it's over your head, it's under his feet. There's nothing that he cannot do. Take my life. I no longer want to live. At that moment, here is Elijah, tired, emotionally tired, physically tired, spiritually tired, intellectually tired, relationally tired, tired. And he does the most religious thing that anyone can do. He does not listen to a C.C. Winans tape. He doesn't listen to Billy Graham preach. He goes to sleep because he's tired. Or as my grandchildren would say, he's tired. And an angel comes and, get up, bakes some bread over hot coals in the desert and gives him a jar of water. He eats and drinks and goes back to sleep. And an angel wakes him up again. And he eats 
and he sleeps. And then on the strength of that meal goes 40 days till he gets to a place called Mount Horeb. It's just interesting to me that God sustains us in so many different ways. The first time when Elijah needed provisions, God sent him some ravens to give him uh, food in the morning and food in the evening and kept the brook babbling. The second time he needed something, God sent him to northwest Palestine. And there's a widow who feeds him. And the third time he needed something, God sends an angel from ravens, birds, to humans, to angels. And I don't know why it is that we try to uh, denominationalize God. There's only one way that God moves. I'm a Baptist. He's got to do it the Baptist way. There's only one way that God moves. Or we try to ethnicize him. You know, God's black, God's white, God's brown, God's yellow, God's red. I discovered that God ain't any of those things. God is just God. Then we try to try to fossilize God. God can't do this any longer. He only worked in the Old and New Testament. And I've known Christians across the centuries and even churches who believe that, uh, you know, God is putting self-limitation upon himself. He, he cannot do the things he did in the Old and New Testament any longer. Those things for past history. And they don't believe in miracles any longer. That's what they say until they need one. They need God to work need God to do a miracle and to save that child. I want you to know that God can deliver you and you need not put any kind of limitations on God, put God in the box. If he wants to do it through angels, fine. If he wants to do it through human beings, fine. If he wants to use blackbirds, fine. Any way you bless me, Lord, that'll be all right. And you don't have to understand how he does it because God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and he rides on every storm. The hymnologist says, God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. He comes to Horeb. Horeb is synonymous with Sinai, same mountain range. He's inside of the cave. He calls himself kind of outrunning God, because when he got to Beersheba, he's at the southernmost part of the southern kingdom, when he's been called to the northern kingdom. It's as if he has gone from Bangor, Maine to Miami, Florida. It's a, me, a way of saying, I'm leaving the ministry. And God asked him the question inside the cave. Elijah, what are you doing here? I've called you to the north. What are you doing down here in Sinai? Lord, I've been zealous for your cause. They, the people of God, have torn down your altars. They've rejected your covenants. They've killed your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And God calls him up on top of the mountain and says, I'm about to pass by you, which must have given Elijah reflections on what God did with Moses in Exodus 33. When Moses asked God this question, show me your glory, and God said to Moses, I am going to blindfold you with my hand because I know how nosy you are and put you in the cleft of the rock so that when I remove my hand, you'll see my back parts, but you won't see the nakedness of my purity and the radiance of my holiness. And God semi-revealed himself to Moses. Now he's getting ready because he manifests himself through his mighty acts. And now he's getting ready to reveal himself and will reveal himself ultimately through his incarnate word. God passes by. Mm. And there's the manifestation of the furious, fast-blowing wind. But God was not in the wind. Sometimes he's there. He was there in the wind, the Red Sea that blew all night long, the east wind, to separate the water so that when the children marched through, they marched through with the water standing up in 
attention like retaining walls. And a highway was in the sea, and they never got their feet wet. But God was not in the wind. Sometimes God is in the fire, and God allowed the fire to come by. It's a manifestation. But God was not in the fire. And Elijah just experienced the fire on Mount Carmel. But God was not in the fire. And then God allowed a earthquake, a rock-splitting earthquake to take place. But God was not in the earthquake. And sometimes God's in the earthquake. He was there on Mount Sinai, the same mountain range. And the children of Israel said, don't let God talk to us. You speak to us. But then God was in the still, small voice, a gentle whisper. And we know that God moved through that because this was the only time that Elijah covers his face with his cloak. Doesn't do it with the, the earthquake, the windstorm, or the fire, but a still, small whisper. His word, that God accomplishes his purpose through his word. My question for us tonight, this afternoon, this morning, whatever time it is, is his word enough? Must I have the earthquake, something sensational? Must I have the windstorm, something magnificent? Must I have the fire, something impressive? Or will just his gentle word be enough? What about when there is no cattle, when there are no cattle in the stall? And when there are no figs on the tree and no, no grapes on the vine? Is his word enough? What about when the thorn remains and God won't remove it and only says, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in weakness? Is his word enough? And then God asked him the same question again. Elijah, what are you doing here? And he gives the same response. I'm zealous for your cause. People have torn down your altars. They rejected your covenants. And they are people who are trying to kill all the prophets and I'm the only one that's left. And God takes and recommissions him and tells him, verse 15, go back. Go back and do through three things. Go back and anoint Hazael, king of Syria. Go back and anoint Jehu, king of Israel. And go and anoint Elisha, who will be the prophet who will replace you. Because God was trying to tell Elijah this. Yes, I'm getting ready to call you away, but I have someone in your place. Or as William Shakespeare would say, all the world's a stage and we are merely actors. And one day, the lights will go off on the stage, the curtains will come down, and we will all disappear and someone else will take our place. And my day will come and someone will take my place. So I must be faithful now while I'm on stage to give God my very best for his glory. Go back. It's a difficult thing to go back. Mm. Jesus had been in the temple with his parents. It was his first bar mitzvah, 12 years of age. They thought that he was with the kinfolk and acquaintance, but he was not. When they discovered that he was not with them as they made their way from Jerusalem to Nazareth, they went back to where they left him and found him in the temple, listening to questions and answering questions that doctors and lawyers were presenting. Go back. Some of us are, mm, have left Jerusalem. God's calling us back, as Andre Crouch would say, take me back, take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Take me back where I first believed. Don't you miss that time of intimacy? Aren't you tired of just going through the emotions? Don't you want to, want to reclaim that fire? Don't you want to fall all in love with Jesus? Oh, no, you, lost, you haven't lost your salvation. But what about the joy of your salvation? Don't you really miss worship? Aren't you tired of worshiping worship? Now you want to worship God? Aren't you tired of having faith in faith? Don't you want to have faith in God? Don't you want more than a degree? Don't you want the very presence of God in your life? Go back. 
to where God called you from during those first fresh moments of your conversion. Go back and anoint these individuals. I've always been impressed with Mark chapter 16, verse 7. Well, where Mary Magdalene is told by Jesus, go and tell my disciples, this is after the resurrection, and Peter, that I go before them to meet them in Galilee. And Peter. Peter would not have attended that meeting if he didn't get a special invitation. He's denied the Lord not once, twice, but three times. And the Lord wanted him to know, yes, you denied me, but I have not denied you. You've given up on me, but I have not given up on you. And Peter, no matter what you've done, what makes me so excited is you may get out of the way of the word, but you can't get the word of the way out of you. And God continues to speak to you. No matter what you've done, shame and embarrassment. And yet God said, there is nothing that can separate you from me. The devil may threaten, but he cannot thwart he cannot overturn what I've done in your life. So get up from where you are. What you failed to accomplish. God says, and Thomas, and Mary, and Susanna, and Jerry, and Tommy, and Robert, and Gokesha, and Tiberius. Mm. He gives us that special invitation to let us know that he constantly seeks us to bring us back because he loves us with an unrelenting love. And God speaks. And Elijah does those things. The one, only other thing God says to Elijah is, I want you to go back to school. Go to accounting class, because you'll know how to count like I count. You say you're the only one left? I've got 7,000 that have not bowed a knee to Baal, nor kissed his image. 7,000 people. Thank God for Elijah. Elijah is a great prophet. He comes from a place called Tish. You know anything about Tish? Relatively unknown. But there's a greater prophet who comes from a place called Nazareth. And Nathaniel asks, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Elijah is a great prophet who owes 40 days and 40 nights and fasts and pray. But there's a greater prophet who fasts 40 days and 40 nights and is tempted of the devil. Elijah left earth and went to heaven without dying. But there's a greater one who left heaven to come to earth to die. And he did die, but he didn't stay dead. He rose on Sunday morning. And one day will reclaim his own where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. I leave you with this. He had before it was a great man, rich man, Dearborn, Michigan, who had a man by the name of Charlie Steinmetz, a symbol, the generators of his first Ford Motor Company assembly. He was making a lot of money, a lot of cars coming off the assembly line, and a lot of employees. But one day, the lights went out, the power went out, the cars stopped coming off the assembly line. And Charlie Steinmetz, though he was rich, uh, was stingy. And he decided to get local mechanics to try and come and fix the generators and the motors so that he could have more cars come off the assembly line and make more money. But none of them were able to do it. He was losing money. He decided that he would finally have to rehire the man who made the uh, generators and the motors. Sure enough, he hired Charlie Steinmetz. And Steinmetz came and started tinkering a little bit. He took and tinkered on the motors. He messed with a few switches. He pushed a few buttons. He finally pulled the main switch and the motors started to come on. The cars came off the assembly line and then started, Steinmetz wrote a bill to Henry Ford for $10,000. Henry Ford looked at it and wrote a bill, or rather wrote an extra question about the exorbitant bill. He said, Charlie, isn't $10,000 a lot of money for a little tinkering? And Charlie Steinmetz replied, 
on that bill. And I demise explanation of the $10,000. He said, $10 for tinkering. $9,990 for knowing where to take them. For uh, this is how God works. Mm -hmm. You may not know what uh, you're going to do, but if you just let him do a little taking, oh, yeah, he will take on your life. And he will take on your mind. Oh, yes, he will take in your life. So just let him do a little tinkering. And one of these days, when we all get to heaven, we'll bow down and give him praise for what he had done. I just want to shout a little bit, but I know my time is up. Let him take it. <laughs> 